Dear colleagues, welcome to the first, first IATA webinar entitled Routine Cerebrospinal Fluid Drainage for TIVAR. Let me introduce myself. I am Purificación Matute from Barcelona, uh, uh, Spain, and I, I, am, uh, I am the present chair of IATA Vascular Sudcon. It's a great honor for me to chair this first webinar. Firstly, I would like to thank to Dr. Mohamed El Tahan for organizing and coordinating this presentation. And also, uh, I would like to thank the moderators and speakers for their collaborations to talk about this interesting and exciting topic. All speakers are experts in this, just in this subject. Now, I would like to introduce Dr. Dragana Unik Stojanovic from Belgrade and Dr. Simon Howell from Bromleeds, both are delegates for Vascular Sudcon, who will introduce the rest of the speakers and moderate this panel. I hope you enjoy and clarify everything about this topic. Thank you uh, very much for your attendance, and please, Simon and Dragana, present and introduce the next speakers. Thank you very much. Fuji, thank you very much indeed for that. It's my pleasure to be one of the joint moderators for this first EACTA webinar. The objectives of this webinar are to update you, the audience, about the current evidence and best practice for routine CSF drainage and to promote and rehearse the practical skills required for CSF drainage and appropriate decision making around that procedure. Um, the webinar consists of four talks. Thank you, Simon. Thank you, Balthazar. Now I would like to introduce our uh, final speaker today. Uh, that will be Professor Jan Schreiber from Maastricht University Medical Center in Netherlands, uh, who will talk about the practical aspect of cerebral fluid uh, drainage uh, in TIVA procedure. Please, Jan. Thank you. Yeah, good evening, everybody, from uh, snowy Maastricht. Um, my name is Jan Schreiber. I'm uh, an anesthesiologist here uh, at uh, Maastricht Medical University Medical Center. And uh, as Fragana said, I would like to highlight some practical aspects. A number of them are already uh, we have talked about. Um, so we are a center uh, performing around 100 procedures per year. Uh, most of them are T-bars, around 75%. The rest is open. If you are talking about uh, the destining aorta, uh, and uh, we also have um, we also doing procedures of the ascending aorta. Um, first of all, I have no conflicts of interest, and you will uh, watch two videos during my talk. And I want to inform you that uh, we gained informed consent uh, of uh, the patients uh, for showing these videos. Uh, I would like to talk shortly about the patient preparation and the equipment we are using. So what, what I'm talking about is how we do it here. So you may take that at the blueprint for your own practice, um, but uh, uh, it's, it's one way in doing it. And your own practice may vary from that. Um, the placement of the catheter itself and further and what to do when things go wrong. So which patient may need it? We have uh, we had a lot of talk about that the last uh, uh, hour and a half uh, about the indication and about recommendations about a number of meta-analysis and, and reviews. Um, we, uh, in our hospital, we are practicing uh, the um, DACTS guideline from 2016 which says that uh, CSF drainage should be considered in patients undergoing TIVA at high risk. So what is high risk for us? Uh, uh, we, we take the patients with a Crawford 1 or 2 aneurysm as high risk patients, and these patients will get uh, a CSF drain preoperatively 
uh, before uh, the procedure starts. Um, there is discussion about patients with Crawford 3 and the later uh, the Crawford 5 um, extension. Crawford 5 was described for the first time in 2012. Um, and the first take home message I want to give you is talk to each other. So what we are doing is, as even as Balthasar uh, told us, we are talking to the surgeons and have discussions about uh, patients uh, about indications for CSF drainage. So um, <clears throat> I think that is, that is uh, beside all evidence, um, the main point that we should be clear with the surgeons which patient may profit, may have benefit, may have profit from a CSF drainage and which wouldn't have. Uh, I think there is no evidence to place uh, 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 a uh, CSF drain preoperatively in patients with a, a class four, um, uh, class four uh, aneurysm, because this is normally this should be subdiaphragmal. For the preparation of the patients, all patients, if they are, uh, if they come for scheduled surgery, uh, will get a pre-screening on our. Um, uh, uh, anesthesiology clinics, and uh, this pre-screening includes um, a basic neurological examination and assessment, and of course the assessment of the history of the patient, uh, the patient's history, and uh, we would be very aware if uh, patients uh, are reporting any neurological problems in their history, in the personal history. Um, there is no specific guideline regarding the uh, policy on anti uh, anticoagulants or uh, anticoagulative drugs. So what we are doing here is we handling the ESA and uh, ESRA guidelines from 2010, which means that low-dose aspirin uh, might be continued, so the patients are allowed to take that through until the procedure. Clopidogrel should be stopped seven days before the procedure and uh, new or, uh, oral anticoagulative drugs should be stopped three to five days before. Um, this takes into the account that some of the patients may have problems with their kidney function. Um, if the patient has a normal kidney function, uh, renal function, uh, any NOACs can be stopped uh, up to 48 hours before. We're doing some basic lab. Next to the renal function, uh, we have a basic correlation check. Um, patients should have platelets above 100, an INR less than 1.3, and a normal APTT. And uh, there are some contraindications, of course. An increased ICP should be a contraindication or should be checked before, uh, as well as uh, any problems uh, uh, with coagulation. There should be a an uh, extended examination of that, and an infection at the platement size would, a site of placement would be an absolute contraindication in our hospital. Okay, that's the set we're using for uh, for our patients. Uh, it's uh, made by Arrow Teleflex. Uh, it's a single orifice uh, catheter, and it's just an example. You can use a normal. Uh, epidural catheter as well. There are specific multi-orifice sets uh, available from the industry. Uh, we have chosen for this uh, set because uh, the catheter contains a, a sort of uh, uh, re reinforcement uh, with a thin uh, metal layer inside, uh, which avoids uh, kinking of the catheter. We had some problems with uh, kinked catheters and, uh, and which which uh, caused some worries uh, in the in the past time, so we switched uh, to these catheters. But as I said, there are a number of uh, number of sets available uh, from um, different manufacturers. So here we'll see the placement. A lot of work for the speakers. So uh, on behalf of the board, I would like to say that we are really indebted to them because 
they were really very brilliant and so committed to this webinar. Uh, it is my pleasure also to thank the IACTA Vascular Scientific Subcommittee, and in particular, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Purificacion Matute, who was the chair of this webinar, and Simon Howell and Tragana Yunich, who were the excellent moderators of this webinar. Um, also, I think that a special thank has to go to the Social Networking Task Force and to MCI for advertising the webinar. And last but not least, a special thank to the committee of IACTA and in particular to the chair, Professor Mohamed Altahan, whose effort made this webinar possible. So really, thank to all these IACTA people who worked very hard uh, on this project. And a very, very special thank goes to all our friends and colleagues connected from all over the world for attending the webinar and making this webinar possible. We could have excellent speakers, but with no audience, the webinar would not be a success. And then I take the occasion to announce the next IECTA webinar from the Thoracic Scientific Subcommittee, which will be held on March 25. So please mark your calendar on March 20. We'll have a very interesting webinar held by the Thoracic Scientific Subcommittee. So thanks everybody for joining and participating and 